Hello everyone. Welcome to ACCA Practice to Pass Sessions. And I'm your tutor, OS Mirchawala, who will be conducting these sessions. Let me give you a brief introduction about me. I've been teaching the advanced taxation exam since more than 30 exam attempts. And nine of my students have secured nationwide positions till now. So these sessions will be very useful and will help you to get a good score and even I expect a nationwide position in whatever country you live in. Okay, now the objective of these sessions is clear by its name that in these sessions we will be practicing the past papers. By the time you are listening my sessions, you must be very clear to the exam. Very near, like it's it may be like 10 days maximum. So by now, I always advise to my students is that you people should be focusing more and more on practicing past paper. Okay, so objective of our session, if I make it clear so that we can have a good 12 hour sessions ahead, objectives of our sessions will be to practice past papers and to revise key exam concepts okay now what we will be doing is that we will be focusing on exam technique and final preparation approach okay now in my experience of last 30 attempts, many students ask me this question that, sir, what is the key reason of failure in advanced taxation? Now, in any of the professional exam, you talk about ATX, you talk about AFM, you talk about APM, you talk about AAA, in any of the professional exam, the primary reason of failure is lack of practice. Now, by the word lack of practice, I mean lack of practice of complete attempt wise papers. What students do is that they prepare each of the topic. OK, they prepare each of the topic. They pre pre practice the topical past papers, but they don't practice the attempt wise papers. Now, this is the reason in all of the professional exams. But in advanced taxation, this reason is very critical. Why? The question is why? Because in advanced taxation, you cannot get complete attempt wise papers on the ECCA website. The normal complete attempt wise papers get outdated due to the change of finance act. So what the students do is that they only practice the exam kit of different publishers. Now, when you do a complete exam kit, it only gives you topical practice. It don't give you attempt wise practice. Now, thanks to ACCA, they have developed a software named as Test Reach, and you can access that software and you can practice complete papers there. But what I know is that many students don't know that what test reach is because many of the tutors don't guide them. OK, so what is the key reason of failure? So the key reason of failure is lack of attempt wise paper practice. Now, see, one is the topical past paper practice. When you do topical past paper practice, it is very easy. You study a topic, you do its past paper. The knowledge is fresh. But when you talk about the attempt wise paper practice, now here you have to deal with all the topics together. Here you have to deal with the time stress, the issues which you face in your real examination. The topical practice is very simple and very easy, but attempt wise practice is the most important thing. And above all, above the attempt wise practice, the most important thing is marking from your tutor. Get your paper marked. Do some mock exams. If you don't have a mock exam, no need to worry. Just download one past paper and complete it in three hours and 15 minutes. Feel the real heat of the exam while you are at the home. 
what you people do is you study the topics, you do the topical past papers, and then you go in the examination. You have no practice to deal with all the topics together. You have no practice to deal with the time management stress. And then what happens is that, sir, we were only able to attempt 70 marks. We were only able to attempt 60 marks. Obviously, it's very difficult to pass that. So the most important thing which creates a difference between an unsuccessful student, the most important thing which creates a difference between an unsuccessful student and a student which gets a position is practice. And not the topical past paper practice, practice of complete attempt wise papers. Okay, now one more thing what many tutors do is or what the approach of many students is they read the question they read the answer they read the question they read the answer this will never give you the approach read the question and type your own answer develop your own answer and then match it with the examiner answer then send it to the tutor for checking you read the question, you read the whole, you say, yes, 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 it's easy, I can do, I can do. And then when you go in the exam, your mind stops working. What you need to do is read the exam question, read the past paper question, open the software and solve it. Very important. At least practice four or five papers on the exam software. At least practice four or five papers on the exam software so that you are hands on. You know how to use the tools. Your typing speed is good. Okay, so please prepare in a better manner because many students get an unsuccessful attempt only due to lack of practice. Now, it is a very common argument of the exam uh, students. Listen to me. I'll start doing the questions, okay? Just this um, discussion is to give you an approach, give you an importance of these sessions, what we are going to start. It is very normal for the students that, sir, um, we were not able to complete 20 marks. We were not able to complete 30 marks. We were not able to complete 15 marks. And then at the time of result, they feel at 48, 49. And then they say, oh, sir, if you would have attempted just 10 more marks, you would have passed. Why were you not able to attempt those 10 marks? The answer is not that you didn't have the knowledge. The answer is that you didn't have proper time management. Now, how do you improve the time management? By practice. Not the practice of topical past papers, practice of complete attempt wise papers. If I would have the control of the students' uh, uh, dockets and the admit cards, I would not have given the docket to the students until and unless they have at least practiced five past papers on the exam software. And they would have got it marked from their tutor because this is the thing which will create a difference between a pass and a fail okay so the real objective of these sessions is hidden its name practice to pass i'm not saying this the cc itself is saying this i'm just a tutor i'm just a facilitator so practice to pass do complete past papers do complete past papers okay now, where can you find these complete past papers? Let's look at that. Where can we find these complete past papers? Let's look at that. Okay. Just give me a second. Let me adjust my screen. Okay. Now, one student is asked, sir, I have a question in, uh, can I use formula without shell? Every, every of your query will be responded that how you have to deal with the spreadsheet, whether you have to give formula or not, everything will be re responded. Okay, let me start one paper so that you can have an idea. Now, so, uh, all of you know that you can go to the ACC Global website, 
okay accglobal.com okay you will open this website i'm just going giving a walk through that where can you find these uh test reach questions okay because some students will not have an idea you will go in the stu students tab and here you will go in oh sorry um study support resources you will go in the students tab then you will click on study support resources okay now once the study support resources paper get, uh, page gets open you'll click on ecca qualification then you will click on your paper advanced taxation okay then you will click on uh, past exam library okay and you go down here you will select your variant we are doing uk tax then you will click on view exams okay so here are the past papers okay here are the complete past papers okay now from here you can download and access the complete past papers now if you want to access the computer-based software you click on the advanced taxation here you go to CBE practice platform, C, CBE question practice, ACC practice platform. Now, once you click here, here you can click on login to the practice platform. And now you will log in through your details. Once you will log in, you will come to this screen. You will come to this screen, okay? Then on the right side, on this catalog, you will click on advanced taxation. You will click on your variant UK. You will click on ACC official resources, then past exam library, and here are the exam papers. Now, these are the exam papers which are updated. These are the exam papers which are updated according to the new finance act, okay? Along with these, you can also do some practice exams. And along with these, you can also do the specimen exam. Is it clear? Now, today we are doing this December 2021 exam. You will click on assign. So the paper will come here. You'll click on assign. The paper will come on the left hand side. And then you'll click on start. Okay. Now, one very good thing. ACCA has uploaded one mock exam for you people also. You must also be getting emails from the ACCA in this regard. So you can do the mock also. But before doing this mock, I will advise that at least complete two papers with me in these sessions. And then at the end of the session, I'll give you one more paper complimentary. So you will have three practice papers with me and then you will do the mock and i want you all to do this mock and send me to marking okay so how how will we send you this is my whatsapp number double zero nine two three four five eight zero double nine eight three one okay so we will practice two complete papers during webinar and Sir will give one paper discussion at the end of session. So total three papers practice with Sir, okay? Then you people have to attempt the mock. You people have to attempt mock and send it for marking, okay? So make a promise that we'll attend all the given hours of the session. We'll attend all the given hours of the session and we will also attend the mock and you people will send me for the marking, okay? And hope so that all people who are attending this session live or recorded will be able to pass the exam in this exam attempt. So we are starting with September, December, 2021 at exam and click on on start so let's start with it these are some basic screens introduction 
next 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 some basic information you all know that obviously you people have given many exams still now next and here the exam paper starts okay you all know that question number one is for 35 marks question two is for 25 marks and then question three and four each for 20 marks each and then the paper starts now many students ask me this question one one more important question so what should be the sequence what should be the sequence of uh, doing the exam paper should we do question four first or we should do question three first what, what should be the sequence how how we should be um attempting the questions like we should be doing with which question first or what should be the approach okay uh, so my advice here would be that uh, there is nothing like that just start with the question number one just start with the question number one and uh, if you feel any requirement as difficult if you feel any requirement as difficult if you feel any requirement as problem just skip it it's for some time just leave it for some time now, since the paper is like computer based you can skip the requirements in between okay and you can come back and do that later now one student has sent a question that sir it will be very good if you could revise the rules with us first see i'll repeat the objective of the session again i'll revise the rules but try to understand my approach we are just 10 days away for away from the exam now whoever is listening to this session it's just very close to the exam if i'll teach the topic and then i'll do the topical past paper practice it will not be too much beneficial this is what you have been doing entire session now the key thing which you need to do is that you have to practice the complete papers now now what i will be doing is that when we will be doing these complete papers when we will be doing these complete papers these are my summary notes they are also attached in the handout tab these are also attached in the handout tab those who will be listening to me through the recording they can ask for me on the whatsapp i shared my whatsapp number so in this summary notes in oh number 56 in these summary notes in like 54 pages i have summarized the entire course the entire course is summarized all the rules are written so while doing any topic in the question we'll just look at the rule at a glance so that if there is any query in relation to the topic that gets cleared okay now let's start you should assume that today's date is first september 2021 okay now one student is asked sir if there are any new topics there are no new topics in the course there are no new topics in the course the course is same okay there is nothing new um just the professional marks are about to increase but that is also not relevant from the current exam attempt okay so course is same yes the finance act is updated so if you need the finance act updations you can ask me on my whatsapp i'll send you the summary for those okay let's start you should assume that today's date is first september 2021 your manager has re received a schedule of information from Hale. The managing director, the managing director of JEG Limited, a potential client of your firm. This schedule and extracts from an email from your manager dealing the work you are required to do are included in the exhibits. The following exhibits available on the left hand side of the screen provide information relevant to the question. Schedule from Hill dated 1st September 21. Email extract from your manager dated 1st September. So this is some very basic information. And normally this is not very much useful. The only useful information in it is the date, which will be used while developing the format of memorandum. Now, let's read the schedule from Hill. 
Okay, I want you all to listen to me. On 1st August 2019, JEG Limited purchased the whole of the share capital of two companies, Cord Limited and List Company. On 1st July 2021, JEG Limited purchased the whole of the share capital of Mort Limited. All four companies in the JEG Limited Group prepares accounts to 31st March each year and are budgeted to be profitable in the year ending 31st March 22. Further details of the company are set out below, followed by summary of recent transactions. Country of residence, JAG Limited is resident in UK, Cord Limited is resident in UK, List Company is resident in Solana, Mott Limited is resident in UK. Country of trading activity, JAG in UK, Cord in UK, List in Solana, and Mott in Puran. Registered for why JAG and Cord, yes. List and Mott, no. Rate of overseas tax. Since JAG and Cord are UK companies, so nothing to worry about the overseas tax. Less and Mott have overseas tax of 11% and 13%. Now, one more thing. While you are reading the question for the first time, don't get frustrated, don't rush. First time reading of question is just normal. It's, it's just normal. Like when you read the question for the first time, maybe there must, must, must be some data which you cannot understand too much, but that's normal. We read the data, then we go back to the requirements. First, we read the data, then we go back to the requirements. Once we read the requirements, once we read the requirements, we come back to the data again. So some students ask me that, sir, isn't it good to read the um, requirements first? Yes, you can do that, but in advanced taxation, but in advanced taxation specifically, when you talk about the requirements, the requirements are not too much useful until you have identified the data in the question. Okay, JAG limited purchase of business. On 1st February, 2021, JAG limited purchased the trade and assets of a business. The only significant asset of the business was its production line which consisted of three large items of fixed machinery, JAG Limited paid 290,000 for these machinery. Cord Limited. Cord Limited is experiencing cash flow problems. On 30th June, 2021, it sold its business premises to an unconnected party for 485,000 resulting in a chargeable gain of 247,000. This building was entirely used in Cord Limited trade throughout the period it was owned. Cord Limited now trades from rented premises. On 1st August 21, it used 120,000 of the sale proceeds to purchase eight delivery vans for use in its trade. List Company. On 1st July 21, on 1st July 21, this company purchased a building situated in Silana for £170,000. This building was immediately bought into use in List Company trade. List Company manufactures industrial equipment which it supplies to customers in Silana and in other countries. It is intended that JAG Limited will purchase components from List Company and import them for use in its own manufacturing trade. In the view of low rate of business tax in Solana, I'm considering pricing strategies which would maximize the profits of the group, which are taxed there. So he's thinking about some transfer pricing. He's thinking about some pricing strategies. So you people should remember the rules of transfer pricing here. Okay, you people should remember the rules of transfer pricing here. Okay. Now. Just a minute. 
Okay, now, Moth Limited. Moth Limited carries on its train, a trade in Puran, where it has production and distribution facility. It has not made any capital additions or disposals of significance since 2019. Value added tax, finally, I'm looking into the possibility of group wide registration. So you've read out this question. Now, one very important thing. See, what I will do is that I'll develop the answer of this paper with you people. Now, what I want from you people is that you people should be a bit active. Those who are specifically attending it live, they should be a bit active. Okay, those students who are attending it live, I want them to be a bit active and respond to me and respond to me through the chat box, through the question staff. You can respond to me through that so that we can discuss and we can um, evaluate the things in a more better manner. Okay, now. Now we have an email from the manager. Let's look at that. What the email from the manager is saying. Okay, now. Um, now when we look at the email, this will give us the more specific detail. I expect that JAD Limited Group to be exciting new client for our firm. Hale has ambitious plans, and although we advise a number of corporate groups, this will give us our first experience of companies operating through permanent establishments situated overseas. I can confirm there is no double tax treaty between the UK and either the country of Silana or the country of Puran. Neither Silana nor Puran are the members of European Union. There are no controlled foreign company implications for you to consider. Please prepare a memorandum for the client files consisting of the work set out below. Part A, becoming tax advisors to JAG Limited Group. Okay, now. Now we are starting with the first requirement. He has asked us to prepare a memorandum for the client files. He has asked us to prepare a memorandum for the client files. And the part A is that we have to comment on becoming the tax advisor to the JAG Limited group of companies. Set out the information we require and the actions we should take before we agree to become the tax advisors to JAG Limited group of companies. Now, this is simply the requirement of ethics. This is simply the requirement in relation to ethics. Now, here what you need to understand is that in advanced taxation exam, we get a requirement of five marks in relation to ethics. We get this requirement of five marks in which the examiner asks us about the ethics. So whenever you get such a requirement, it is a very simple requirement. Now, when you do the past papers, there are like four or five bunch of requirements in relation to ethics, which he asks normally. In relation to ethics, there are four or five bunch of requirements which he asks normally. So what you can do is that you can prepare those bunch of requirements. What you can do is that you can prepare those bunch of requirements so that you can get this easy score. Becoming tax advisor to JAG Limited Group of Company. Now, this is a simple requirement of ethics. That what is the information and the actions which we will take? We will look at their proof of identity. We will look at their uh, business uh, legitimacy of the business we will look about the address of the directors those who control the company some simple information and we will look at the competency of the firm we will take the clearance from the previous uh, tax advisor so this is simple five marks the examiner normally gives assignments of five marks in advanced taxation exam what you need to do is what you need to do is that you need to prepare these requirements through past paper practice. Okay, like when you will do five, six past papers, you will be able to deal with all of these bunch of requirements. 
Okay, now how many marks for this first requirement? So it's, if you look here, becoming tax advisor to JAG limited group of companies, it's five marks. We have to prepare memorandum as requested by the email. Now we'll just do with these easy first five marks. Let's look at it. I want you all to concentrate on it so that you people can understand in a better manner. Okay, now. Question number one, JAG Limited Group, okay? We are preparing a memorandum since it's the question number one and we have professional marks in it. You can see here, professional marks will be awarded for the approach taken to problem solving, the clarity of the explanation, the effectiveness with which the information is communicated and overall presentation and style of memorandum. Now, either the examiner ask memorandum or he ask us about the uh, meeting notes. Either he ask the memorandum or he ask the meeting notes. Now, it's always the same. You use the normal format, okay? So this memorandum will be filed in text files. We are the text senior or manager in this question, okay? Client name is Jag Limited Group. Client name is Jag Limited Group. We need to give the date and the subject is Group Tax Planning Matters. Okay. Now, where can we get the date? I'll click here, close all the tabs. The date is 1st September. Okay. The date is 1st September. 2021 so 1st September 2021 so please don't forget to make this format in the question number one it will give you easy one mark maybe this will be the difference between the 49 and 50 gap okay so this will give you an easy one mark now let's start with the first requirement becoming tax advisor to JAG limited group of companies for five marks. Okay. Yes, anyone. What are the matters and actions which we should consider before becoming the tax advisor? Anyone, please start corresponding with me on the questions tab. Okay, I want you all to be communicative. Okay. Set out the required information we require and the actions we should take before we agree to become tax advisor. Yes, one student has uh, written that, sir, uh, we'll talk about the money laundering issues. Okay. We'll talk about the money laundering issues. Okay. We'll think about the company's source of income, the director's presence. Okay. Uh, guys, I'll take a 10 minutes break. I have to go for the prayers. Um, um, basically, my timing difference and your timing difference is different. Different. I'm currently in uh, Makkah on Umrah. So I'll go for the namaz break and we'll resume in 15 minutes. Okay, guys? And then we'll continue. Okay? We are going for a break of 15 minutes. Namaz break. Uh, and we'll resume in 15 minutes. Um, I'm in... Uh, Saudia currently, so my timing difference is a bit different from you people. Okay, we'll resume in 15 minutes.
Okay, so we are resuming back. Just a second. Okay, please confirm me that everyone is with me. I need people can hear me, okay? So we were doing this first requirement, becoming a tax advisor to JAG limited group of companies. Set out information we require and the actions we should take before we go, we agree to become tax advisor to the JAG limited group of companies. Now you all know that this is a standard requirement of ethics. Now there are a bunch of requirements as I was talking about before the break that he asked about that what are the matters you will consider before accepting to be the client and uh, then one standard requirement is um, if the client is doing any wrong activity what are the actions you will take um, then one standard requirement is uh, that what is the difference between tax evasion and avoidance so these are some bunch of requirements of like five five marks now what i advise to my students is that when you do the past paper practice if you do like four five or ten past paper practice you'll get to know all of them okay so no need to worry and these are the cash marks so we made the basic format on the memorandum and now we are starting this requirement i'll say it again i'm not just making you go through to the examiner answer it is very simple for me to open the answer and we'll just discuss it i develop the answer with my students when i develop the answer with you people you people start using your mind and you get to know that okay this is the difficulty which I'll face in the examination. Okay, so what are the matters you will consider and what are the actions you will take? So our firm should consider, our firm should consider about uh, legal existence of JAG Limited Group. We should obtain information, we should obtain information about proof of existence of companies within group or proof of existence of companies within group addresses of their registered head offices and detail of their business activities okay so the first thing which we will the first information which we'll try and obtain is some detail about their existence their businesses their registered head offices okay now what what else we can do what what else information we'll try to obtain okay further information about people who control jag limited group will also be obtained. Names and detail of directors of the group, their residencies, their residencies, that what are their residency status, where do they reside, and who control the company, okay? Name and detail of the directors and their residency. Okay, what now see the first is I'm writing about the information which we will obtain and then we will discuss some of the actions also. Now these are the informations which we will obtain. We will obtain information about their registered head offices. We will obtain information about their proof of existence. We will obtain information about the people who control the company. Okay, information about group structure about group structure will also be obtained will also be obtained that what are the companies that what are the companies included in jag limited group and their residency status okay so these were like the informations which we will obtain now some actions like one student discuss uh, referred in the question stop our firm should take our firm should take professional clearance from previous tax advisor 
of JAG Limited Group to gain detail about their reason of termination and, and any ethical issues if exist, if they exist. Okay, what else we can do? We can think about the competency of the firm. Because if you read the email exhibit from your manager, if you read the email exhibit from your manager here, I expect that JAG Limited Group to be an exciting new client for the firm. Hill has ambitious plans. And although we advise a number of corporate groups, this will give us our first experience of company operating through permanent establishments situated overseas. So we should think further, our firm should evaluate its competency to deal with JAG Limited Group. Okay, our firm will be dealing for the first time with a client having an overseas permanent establishment. Okay, we should make sure that we have relevant competencies to do work of JAG Limited Group with due care. Okay, so if you look at my answer, see, I'll say it again. What I try and do is that I write like a student. This is how you will drop in the examination. You can think about the integrity of the client. Very good. You can think about the integrity of the client. There are any ongoing investigation, any money laundering issues also. Okay. Now, one student has asked me that, sir, is it okay to present the answer in form of bullet points? It's not advisable. What you can do is that you can make the small paragraphs like I have made. Don't use these bullets. You can use them, but try and use them less. The examiner used them in its answer, but use them less. Instead of these bullets, make small paragraphs. The benefit of making these small paragraphs is that you will be able to identify that yes, one mark is done, two marks are done, three, four, five, like, like in all these small paragraphs, I discussed separate information. Okay? Now, very good question. So should we use the Word or Excel while answering the question? Now, it is completely your choice. It is completely your choice. But if you ask me for my opinion, if you ask me for my opinion, my opinion is that stick to the word processor only. Use this manual calculator. You can take the calculator with you in the exam. Use this manual calculator and stick to the word processor screen only. Now the question is, sir, that why you are advising us so? I'm advising this because in my opinion, again, I'm saying this is my opinion, you people can differ. If you feel com comfort comfortable with the spreadsheet, you can go with that also. But my opinion is that switching the screens while answering the requirement is a bit hassle. What I personally do, and you will see that while I'm answering, I will use this table. I will use this table and I'll be using my calculator to answer the question. Because I personally feel that while I'm answering here, and then for the calculation, because on spreadsheet, you will go for the calculation. For the calculation, I open the spreadsheet. Then I answer some on the spreadsheet. I answer some on the word processor. I personally feel that this will be wasting my time. And, and I personally feel that um, this makes it confusing for me. Like um, Half calculations are on a different screen and the commentary are on a different one. So I recommend you use the word processor, but still it's your choice. While we we'll do the answer, maybe you will agree with me. Okay, I'll try and convince you. Okay, now 
and above all the spreadsheet i feel that it's not much user friendly it's not like the ms excel we use it's the excel is like using the shortcuts but here we don't have the shortcuts obviously so if we don't have shortcuts then using the calculator like we have been doing from our uh <laughs> from the very start, it would be more easy, but still it's your choice. The ACC says that it's the choice of the student to decide that whatever tool he is comfortable with, okay? Coming back. So the first easy requirement was becoming a tax advisor to JAG Limited Group. Okay, becoming a tax advisor to JAG Limited Group, that was the first easy requirement. How many marks? So there were five easy marks which we have attempted and the four professional marks obviously while we have started answering so our firm should consider about the legal existence the people who control information about the group structure we should think about the professional clearance and we should evaluate the competency of the firm is it clear you can write a point on money laundering also that we should think about the money laundering issues of the jag limited group okay the legitimacy of their business activity now coming back let's read the second requirement relieving the chargeable gain on sale of code limited's business premises i want you all to concentrate and listen to me with motivation okay relieving the chargeable gain on the sale of code limited's business premises explain the matters which should be brought um, so my problem uh, with the formats is I don't know the person I'm addressing to. This is my second attempt. You are a tax supervisor and you are addressing to a manager. Okay. Let's, uh, you just, just learn this format of memorandum. There is nothing difficult. In it. Okay. Always, always copy paste this. Okay. Just learn it. So you are responding to a manager and you are a senior or a supervisor, but it's more easy for you to learn. Just look at the question. If he's asking for memorandum, write the heading of memorandum. If he's asking for meeting notes, just put meeting notes instead of it. Okay, that will be more easy for you. Coming back. Now, relieving the chargeable gain on the sale of Cord Limited's business premises. Explain the matters which should be brought to the Hale's attention in relation to the availability of rollover relief in respect of the chargeable gain on sale of cord limited business premises and the way in which this relief would operate. Now, everyone, I want you all to participate with me. What is rollover relief? Please tell me, what is rollover relief? Now, this is what you people want. That's a please revise the topic also. So let's discuss, what is rollover relief? We sell a qualifying asset. We sell a qualifying asset and we reinvest the proceeds in another qualifying asset within qualifying period. And we can get the gain deferred. We can get the gain rolled over. Now, this is the point where my summary notes are a lifesaver. Now, see, these are the summary notes which contain all the rules together. Just run to capital gains tax. I'll go to the capital gains tax. Uh, yes, here is the capital gains tax. And here is the rollover relief. If the proceeds from the disposal of falling assets is reinvested within three years or one year before, then the gain can get different. So these summary notes should be very hands-on with you people. You people should be very fast in circulating the summary notes because these summary notes will help you while you are doing the past papers it's like just 54 pages and they are attached in the handouts tab for those who are attending live and those who will be attending through recording you can ask me on the whatsapp i'll send them i have shared my whatsapp number at the start of the session okay coming back Explain the matters which should be brought to Hale's attention in relation to the availability of rollover relief in respect of the chargeable gain on the sale of cord limited business premises and the way in which this relief will operate. If I look the requirements, it seems to be an easy nine marks requirement. I'll bring it here on my screen and then we'll go back and read the question details once again 
So, this is my second requirement. Okay, now let's go to the schedule and read it one time again about some cord limited business premises. Cord limited is experiencing cash flow problems on 30th June 2021. It sold the business premises to an unconnected party for 485,000, resulting in a chargeable gain of 247,000. The building was entirely used in Cord Limited Street. Throughout the period, it was owned. So, this is the business premises which are being sold. Cord Limited now trades from rented premises. On 1st August 21, it used 120,000 of the sale proceed to purchase eight delivery vans. Now, you need to be clear here that delivery vans do not qualify for rollover relief. Delivery vans do not qualify for rollover relief because these are movable plant and machinery. On movable plant and machinery, we don't get rollover relief. On movable plant and machinery, we don't get any rollover relief. Rollover relief is for fixed plant and machinery. Now, many students are not clear for this concept here. Okay, so if you want, you can write it somewhere. Now, these are the important things which you need to remember. Okay, so rollover relief is not available on movable plant and machinery. So on these eight delivery vans, there will be no rollover relief. Okay, now, now, uh, so Cord Limited has made a disposal and it has a gain of 247. It has reinvested in delivery vans, but the delivery vans themselves are not the qualifying asset for rollover because these are movable plant and machinery. On movable plant and machinery, we don't get rollover relief. Now, what to do? Now, I'm thinking, and yes, I got a concept. What about the capital gains group? There is a capital gains group in the question because JAG Limited owns whole of the share capital of COD, less, and it also owns the whole of the share capital of MOT Limited. So there is a capital gains group. In capital gains group, the reinvestment can be done by ourselves or by companies within our capital gains group. Okay? Now, one student has asked that, sir, in order to save time, can we write triple zero or K instead of thousand? Yes, you can do it. You can do it. But my advice is that don't do this in question number one when professional marks are involved. Okay? Now, let's come and write developing the answer because it's the nine marks requirement. So there must be something involved in it. Okay? So, uh, Cod Limited has made a disposal on 30th June 2021. And it has disposed business premises. Chargeable gain, chargeable gain in relation to disposal of Cod Limited business premises can be deferred through rollover relief as business premises are a qualifying asset for rollover relief because it is a land and building used in trade by Cod Limited. See, I'm writing like a student. You people write this. Chargeable gain in relation to disposal of cord limited business premises can be deferred to rollover relief as business premises are a qualifying asset for rollover relief because it is a land and building. Land and building do qualify. Using rate by cord limited. In order to defer the gain, in order to defer gain, it is necessary that reinvestment is made in any another qualifying asset within qualifying period by Cod Limited itself or by companies 
within its capital gains growth. Okay? See, don't rush in the exam. Write with confidence and things will go on. Okay? Don't rush and don't get frustrated how, oh, how I'll start. Just start doing it. Don't get worried. Okay? So in order to defer the gain, it is necessary that reinvestment is done, is made in any other qualifying asset within qualifying period by God Limited itself or by companies within its qualifying capital gains group. Now, qualifying assets, qualifying assets for rollover relief include land and building, fixed plant and machinery, and goodwill. Okay? Qualifying period for rollover relief is one year before and three years after the disposal date. In case of cord limited, in case of cord limited's disposal, this qualifying period will be, so you can go back one year before, will be, now what was the disposal date by cord limited? It's 30th June 2021, so go back one year will be from 1st June 2020 to 1st June 2024, if I'm not wrong. From, th uh, sorry, 30th June, not 1st June. 30th June 20 to 30th June 24, because the disposal date is 21. So one year before, so it's 20 and up till three years after. So 22, 23 and 24. Okay, in case of cord limited disposal, this qualifying period will be from 30th June 2020 to 30th June 2024. You can write in bracket that disposal date is 30th June 2021. So we went back 12 months and three years after. See, it's going on, it's very simple. Some of the students listening to the webinar must have given this paper also. But when you are in exam, I don't know that why you people rush, why you get frustrated. Just do with confidence. Believe me, the main reason of your failure is lack of past paper practice. You don't do complete past papers. When students fail and they come to me and they say that, sir, we failed in the exam. The first question which I ask from them is, how many papers you practiced on the software? And they say zero. They say zero. When they say zero to me, I always say that this was bound to happen. This is bound to happen. You have to do complete papers, okay? This is September, December 2021 paper. Okay, no rollover relief, no rollover relief. The requirement is rollover relief on movable plant and machinery. On movable plant and machinery, we cannot defer gain. On movable plant and machinery, we cannot defer gain, not even holdover. Holdover is also on fixed plant and machinery. If the plant and machinery is movable, we cannot defer gain, okay? Now, qualifying period for rollover relief is one year before and three years after the disposal date. In case of cord limited, the qualifying period will be from 30th June 20 to 30th June 2024. Companies within capital gains group of cord limited include, now what are the companies in our capital gains group? Include JAG limited, Cord Limited itself. Uh, the third one was List Company, if I'm not wrong, because all the companies are owned 100% by the JAG Limited itself. List Company and Mort Limited. List Company and Mort Limited. For Capital Gains Group, for Capital Gains Group, parent company must own at least 
75% direct holding and 50% indirect holding. In case of Quad Limited, all the companies, all the companies have a common parent company, have a common parent company, JAG Limited, which owns their whole share capital, which owns their whole share capital. This satisfies requirement of 75% direct and 50% indirect holding. Okay, so see my approach, I'm answering the uh, requirement of nine marks. First of all, I talk that yes, the rollover relief will be available because Cord Limited has sole business premises. It's a qualifying asset. Then we discussed the qualifying assets for rollover relief. We looked at the qualifying period, and then we looked at the companies within the capital gains group. Yes, I will share these answers with you people, so no need to worry. Okay, don't, no need to write. I'll share these answers at the end of the session on the WhatsApp group and also on the handout section. Okay, just listen to me and it will be very good if you people just open the question paper with you people on the computer screen or on your mobile or on some other device so that you people can participate with me. Okay, so now we have written the companies within the capital gains group. Now let's look at the companies which have made the reinvestment. Now Cord Limited itself has reinvested in eight delivery vans. So let's first comment on the Cord Limited itself. Okay, Cord Limited itself has reinvested in eight delivery vans on 1st August 2021. On this reinvestment, rollover relief will not be available as these are movable plant and machinery and on move it, as these are movable plant and machinery on which rollover relief is not available. Okay, so let's uh, hit the cord limited first. Okay, let's move forward. Let's look more, okay? Now JAG Limited, purchased on 1st February 21, it purchased uh, the trade and assets of a business. The only significant asset was the production line consisted of three large items, fixed machinery, JAG Limited paid 290,000 for these machineries. So yes, the rollover relief will be available here. JAG Limited reinvested in qualifying period in fixed plant and machinery, in fixed plant and machinery, okay, you can read it here. It's written fixed machinery, okay, 290,000. JAG Limited reinvested in qualifying period in fixed plant and machinery, okay, this will invested in qualifying period in fixed plant and machinery on 1st February 2021. So yes, 1st February 2021 is in the qualifying period because the range is from 30th June 20 to 24. This will qualify for rollover relief. Okay, reinvestment amount is, how much is the reinvestment amount? It's 290,000 if I'm not wrong. Yes, reinvestment amount is 290,000, but the cord limited premises were sold for 485,000. Reinvestment amount was 290,000. This can, this can defer part of the gain of cord limited business premises as proceeds of business premises were how much were 485,000 okay so jag limited reinvested in qualifying period defer means uh, 
then the gain will be charged later, rollover. Okay. Chag Limited reinvested in qualifying period in fixed plant and machinery on 1st February 21. This will qualify for rollover relief. Reinvestment amount is 290,000 pounds. This can defer part of the gain of cord limited business premises as proceeds of business premises were 485,000. See if any other company has done reinvestment. List company. On 1st July 21, List Company purchased building situated in Silana for 170,000. Now, this was a very good thing he asked in this exam. I have a question. Do we get rollover relief on foreign assets? Do we get rollover relief on foreign assets? So the answer is no. No. Okay. List Company is a non-UK resident company and it has purchased the asset for business in overseas. So there will be no rollover in it. If the company would be UK resident, if the company, if the company would be UK resident, then rollover would be available if it would have been purchasing the asset for its overseas permanent establishment. Then the situation would be different then the situation would be different. But here, list companies, non-UK resident and non-UK resident company purchasing asset for its uh, non-UK business. So the simple answer will be that, simple answer will be that non-UK resident companies cannot get privileges of capital gains group, if you remember the capital gains group. If you go in the topic of the capital gains group, I'll go to corporation tax, just open the summary notes. I'll go in the capital gains group. And here you can have a point on overseas companies. If you can look here, overseas companies can be part of capital gains group, but they cannot claim any privileges. Okay. So list company has also invested, but list company cannot get the privilege. List company has also reinvested, has also invested in a building, in a building, but its reinvestment will not qualify for rollover relief as it is a non-UK resident company and non-UK resident companies cannot get capital gains group privileges. Okay, if, if listen to me, if list company would be a UK resident company, I'm using word if list company would be a UK resident company, and it would be reinvesting in its foreign permanent establishment. Permanent establishment means a foreign branch. Then rollover relief would be available. But the company should be UK resident. Here the company is not UK resident. Then the company is not UK resident. It's very simple that there is no privilege for non-resident companies. I'll repeat it again. The capital gains group privileges are only available to those who are UK resident. This is the very basic thing. We have already studied this. Here, the list companies are non UK resident. But, sir, now we have a question. If, if list company would be UK resident, if list company would be UK resident and it would be purchasing any asset for its overseas branch, yes, then rollover relief would be available because the company would be UK resident. For overseas branches, everything is treated that they are of UK. Okay? So, this company has also invested in a building, but this reinvestment will not qualify for rollover relief because it's a non UK resident company. And as far as MOT company is concerned, it has not made any capital additions or disposals of significance since 2019. Okay? Only qualifying reinvestment is of JAG Limited 
only qualifying reinvestment is JAG Limited, which is of 290,000 in fixed plant and machinery. Okay, this is the only qualifying investment. Now, it is not necessary to put the sign of pound. Uh, what I do, I have done is that uh, you can you can go here and from symbol you can add the sign of pound. But what I do is that I add it one time and I use Control C to copy it. I use Control C to copy it. Okay, and then every time I just paste it so it saves time. Okay, but if you uh, sometimes if you forget to use the sign, that's not a big deal. Okay. How to add automatically commas in numeric values? No, there is no automatic. You have to use the comma on the keyboard, okay? <laughs> now, let's add a table, okay? So, chargeable gain on sale of business premises. What was the chargeable gain on sale of business premises? Can you people tell me? So, the chargeable gain was 247,000. The chargeable gain was 247,000. So 247,000 is the chargeable gain. We will deduct rollover relief from here. Okay. And then we will get chargeable now. I hope you all remember that how the rollover relief operates. Do you people remember or you have forgotten? Please tell me. How rollover relief operates? Tell me. The chargeable now is lower off. Yes, now an answer comes on the question screen. Now, chargeable now is lower off. Chargeable now is lower off two things. Number one is cash in hand. Number one is cash in hand. What is the cash in hand in our case? The proceeds were 485,000. The proceeds were 485,000, whereas we reinvested only 290,000. Okay, so use the manual calculator. If you, if you are solving on the spreadsheet, that would be automatic calculation. So the chargeable now is 195,000 and our gain is, gain is the chargeable gain, the chargeable gain, so it's 247,000. So lower off will be chargeable now, that is 195,000. So the rollover relief will be a balancing figure. Can anyone tell me? Can anyone tell me 247 minus 195? So it's 52,000 goes in the rollover relief. Okay, now, now one important thing. This gain is rolled over against fixed plant and machinery of JAG Limited, okay? as plant and machinery qualify for row for capital allowances therefore deferred gain will get chargeable on earlier of three things can anyone tell me basically these are the points of holdover relief because when the asset is of capital allowances the relief is uh, if I talk by literal words, it's holdover relief. Disposal of plant and machinery. Cessation of business use. And 10 years since deferral. Okay. It is possible that if any other, that if any other qualifying asset is purchased before crystallization of this gain, deferred gain can be transferred against base cost of that asset. 
Okay, I will repeat it again because I believe that some students might not be very clear in this concept. Some students might not be very clear in this concept because this is a very really examined issue. Okay, now for those students who say that, sir, please teach us some topic. When I teach you the topic, you will never be able, you will never be able to go these petty issues of the course. If I just teach you the rollover relief, you'll never be able to hit this petty issue. For these petty issues, you need to do the past papers because when you look at the scenario, now the petty issues get relevant. Now listen while I repeat this. First of all, right, it will be very uh, important if you make a note somewhere. For movable plant and machinery, there is no deferral. For movable plant and machinery, there is no deferral. No rollover, no holdover. For movable plant and machinery, there is no deferral, no rollover, no holdover. For fixed plant and machinery, you can go for deferral. But if it is an asset eligible for capital allowance, then by literal words, we are going for holdover relief. Okay, but examiner don't use the word of holdover. He simply use rollover because by rollover, he means deferral. By rollover, he means deferral. Since the gain is getting deferred against the plant and machinery, which is an asset qualifying for capital allowance, so the gain will be deferred, but due through holdover, and the gains of holdover get chargeable when the plant and machinery is disposed of, when the business use is ceased, or when there is seizage, or when there are 10 years completed since the deferral. Now, listen to me. In normal rollover relief, there is no 10 years limit. In normal 10 rollover relief, there is no 10 years limit. The rollover relief is unlimited. The rollover relief is unlimited. It goes on. But this holdover gets crystallized. By word crystallized, I mean chargeable. By word crystallized, I mean it becomes chargeable. So the rule is, that before this gain becomes crystallized, before this gain becomes chargeable, you can transfer this gain to any other asset, which is a normal rollover relief asset. You can transfer this gain to any other asset, which is a normal rollover relief asset, so that this 10 years issue is ended. Now, what do I mean? See, we dispose the business premises. Please listen to me. We dispose the business premises. We reinvested in fixed plant and machinery. We reinvested in the fixed plant and machinery. The gain has got deferred. The gain has got crystallized. Or the gain has got deferred. It's not getting chargeable. It has got deferred. It has got, got rolled over. Okay? The gain has got deferred. But since the asset is a plant and machinery, it qualifies for capital allowance, the gain will get chargeable on 10 years. Okay, one student is saying that, sir, I'm confused between rollover and holdover. Let's take five minutes and revise this. Please listen to me carefully. What is rollover relief? You dispose a qualifying asset and you reinvest in a qualifying asset. Your gain gets deferred. This is rollover relief. It's simple. You dispose a qualifying asset, you reinvest in a qualifying asset within qualifying period. What are the qualifying assets? Line and building, fixed plant and machinery, and goodwill. Clear? Now one thing. If the qualifying asset is a capital allowance asset, if the qualifying asset is a capital allowance asset, if the qualifying asset is a capital allowance asset, then instead of rollover, we use the word holdover. Everything is same. Only difference is that the gain will get chargeable when 10 years are completed. When 10 years are completed. So this means, if I make it very simple for you, rollover relief, rollover relief in a capital allowance has a maximum limit of 10 years. Very simple. 
roll over relief in a capital allowance asset has a maximum limit of 10 years after which the gain will get crystallized after which the gain will get charged very simple don't remember the word holders very simple if the asset is a capital allowance asset it will get chargeable after 10 years but obviously this 10 year limit obviously this 10 year limit is a problem so the tax department says that before the crystallization of the gain now what is crystallization before it gets chargeable you can transfer the deferred gain in any other normal asset if you purchase any if you purchase any normal asset like you purchase any land and building you can say that okay i want to transfer this deferred gain into the base cost of the new asset so this 10 year issue will end for you okay now one student is asked sir how you have calculated the balancing figure uh, my friend the chargeable gain was given in the question okay the rollover relief says that chargeable now will be lower of two things cash in hand and gain so the chargeable now was 195000 so if the chargeable gain is if the chargeable gain is 247000 and chargeable now is 195,000. So automatically the balancing figure, the difference is 52,000, which is deferred. Yes, in capital allowance, I said maximum deferral period is 10 years. Okay. My friend, by the word transfer, I mean that what you can do is that if you purchase any other qualifying asset, now you or your companies within Capital Gains Group, the 52,000 deferred gain, you can adjust it in the base cost of any other qualifying asset which you have purchased before this gain gets crystallized. So you get saved from this 10 year issue. Okay. Now, one student has asked, sir, please repeat the concept of this lower off. My friend, in rollover relief, the concept is in rollover relief, the concept is that the gain which is chargeable now after adjusting rollover relief is lower of two things: your gain and the cash in hand. Your gain and the cash in hand. Because the tax department says that if you have some cash in hand, you should pay the tax. If you have some cash in hand, you should pay the tax. So we got proceed of 485, we reinvested 295, 290. So our cash in hand, our cash in hand is 195,000. Our cash in hand is 195,000. And our gain is 247. So the lower off will get chargeable now. When the lower off will get chargeable now, the balancing value will become the role. Okay? Okay, now there are some more questions. Let me respond them one by one. Sir, sorry, got delayed in joining the class. Uh, this is September, December 2021 paper. You can complete the missed part through recording also, but from here you can join me. Uh, through uh, holdover relief is for depreciable assets. Yes, the holdover relief is for depreciable asset. Uh, my friend, I just taught the concept to one student like five minutes ago. Um, I'll repeat it again. Just listen to me carefully. See, what is rollover relief? Rollover. Through rollover relief, we defer the gain. Just listen to me very easy. Through rollover relief, we defer the gain. Okay? But if we are deferring the gain in an asset which qualifies for capital allowance, then we call it as a holdover relief. The only difference is that the gain will then get chargeable on 10 years. Okay? Everything is same, but the asset if we are purchasing is a capital allowance asset, the gain gets chargeable in 10 years. So in holdover relief, we don't adjust the base cost, rather, the, rather we freeze the gain. Okay? Now, sir, can we say the depreciating asset word? Yes, you can say that also. So land and building are also eligible for capital allowance in form of structure building allowance. Yes, they are eligible. Yes, they are eligible, but structure building allowance will not affect the application of rollover relief. Okay, let's move forward. I hope that you are clear with it. So this was a nine marks requirement. 
So we have done the first 14 marks of the paper. Let me give you a brief review. Memorandum, the format of the memorandum, it's better to learn it. It's better, better to learn it and remember it so that it's easy for you to get easy one mark. Okay, now there was a requirement in relation to ethics, becoming a tax advisor, becoming a tax advisor to JAG Limited Group. So that was a simple requirement in relation to ethics. Then there was relieving chargeable gain on sale of cord limited business premises. Um, one student has asked, sir, that this rule of transferring the gain of holdover to rollover is possible in capital gains group or it applies on individuals also. It applies on individuals also, okay? If the question is of individual CGT, then this requirement applies in individuals also, okay? Now, so chargeable gain in relation to disposal of cord limited group can be referred to rollover relief as business premises are qualifying asset for rollover, okay? Now, qualifying assets include land and building, fixed plant and machinery and goodwill. We talked on the qualifying PVA. Now we talked on the companies within capital gains group. So first I discussed the rules, the technical issues which are applicable. Then we picked up each of the reinvestment. Cod Limited itself reinvested in eight delivery vans. Now the delivery vans do not qualify for rollover relief because they are movable plant and machinery. Jag Limited reinvested in qualifying period in fixed plant and machinery. This qualifies for rollover relief. List company do not qualify because it's a non uk resident company. So there was only one qualifying reinvestment and then we worked out the rollover relief. Is it clear or is there any other query? Uh, non uk resident companies are part of the group, but they don't get the privileges. They are part of the group, but they don't get any privileges. Okay, still, if you have any query, you all have my WhatsApp number. I shared it at the start of the um, session. You can ask me on my WhatsApp, okay? Don't feel any issue that uh, I'm not a uh, sir student, so I should be reluctant. There is no reluctance. You can ask me the question. And even I told you people that you all have to attend two papers during these webinars, and I'll give you one paper more complimentary, then you have to attend the mock and send me for the marking. My basic objective is to make all the students pass who are attending this session. Okay, let's come back and move forward. Now, let's come back to the email of the manager. Now, one piece of advice to the students, listen to me. When you are doing the exam question and when you have answered it, just read the requirement one time again. Because sometimes what happens is that we miss out some of the points. So let's read it. Explain the matters which should be brought to Hale's attention in relation to the availability of rollover relief in respect of the chargeable gain on sale of code limited business premises and the way in which rollover relief operates. So I think that we have brought the matters in his attention that who are in the group, qualifying period, qualifying asset, everything. And we have also discussed that how the relief operates. Now let's move to part C. Taxation of the profits generated. List company. Explain the implications in relation to UK corporation tax payable of list company charging JAG Limited inflated price for its components in order to maximize the profits of the group, which are taxed in Silana. JAG Limited is a small enterprise for the purpose of transfer pricing regime. Again, everyone, please be alert. Everyone, please be alert. Tell me the rule of transfer pricing. What is transfer pricing? Everyone, what is transfer pricing? When we do transaction, when we do transaction within the group at a price which is non arm's length, when we do transaction within the group which is at non arm's length price, the transfer pricing issues become applicable. The transfer pricing issues become applicable. 
Okay, you can go to the summary notes. You can go to the summary notes. And you can open the rules of transfer pricing. The purpose of making you people use these transfer pricing rules is that giving you a habit that you have to keep these set of 50 to 51 pages with you people so that you people can be very hands-on with them. Okay, so if over enterprising is done by group companies, then the tax department says that you, you have to do the transfer pricing adjustment. Okay, now what do transfer pricing adjustment do? It just brings the transaction to arm's length. Okay, now anti avoidance will apply on SME if they are trading with overseas company in a non qualifying territory. What is a non qualifying territory? Country with whom UK has no double tax treaty. So if you look at the question, list company, if you look at the question, just a second. If you look at the question, list company, uh, there is no double tax treaty between UK and either the country of Silana or the country of Puran. So if you look at the question, list company is resident in Silana. So list company is resident in Silana and we have no treaty. We have no double tax treaty with Silana. You can read it here. So if the con company, if the company is in a country with whom UK has no double tax treaty, we call it as a non-qualifying territory. And if there is a transaction with a non-qualifying territory company, the anti-avoidance will apply. So please repeat, list company is resident in the country of Silana. List company is resident in the country of Silana. Silana is a country with whom UK has no double tax treaty. So if you look at the rules of transfer pricing, anti-avoidance will apply on SMEs. SME means small and medium entities if they are trading with overseas companies in non-qualifying territory. What is a non-qualifying territory? Country with whom UK has no double tax treaty. Okay, is it clear? So anti-avoidance will bring the transaction to arm's length. Okay, so in relation to list company, we have to talk on this inflated price issue. Let's look at the requirement. Now, uh, this is the total requirement of nine marks, which include detail of mod limited also. Now, one student is asked, yes, is anti-avoidance and transfer pricing one in the same thing? See, anti-avoidance is a broad thing. It applies on different situation. Anti-avoidance of transfer pricing says that the transaction will be converted to arm's length. What is anti-avoidance, which stops the tax avoidance? So anti-avoidance is in personal service company also. Anti-avoidance is in inheritance tax also. In relation to transfer pricing, the anti-avoidance restricts over under pricing. Okay? Now, so taxation of overseas profits is uh, in total. So we have to read MOT limited also. MOT limited, explain the rate of corporation tax, which will be suffered by MOT limited in UK on the profits generated by its permanent establishment in Puran. Now, if you look at the MOT limited, MOT limited is resident in UK. See. Please participate. Mot Limited is resident in UK. Mot Limited is resident in UK. Okay. But it is operating through permanent establishment in Puran. Mot Limited carries on its trade in Puran. Mot Limited is resident in UK. Mot Limited is a UK resident company. So what he's saying here is the rate of corporation tax which will be suffered by Mot Limited on the profits generated by its permanent establishment in Quran. Everyone, I have a question. 
if you have an overseas permanent establishment, if you have an overseas branch, how do you tax it in UK? If you have an overseas branch, if you have an overseas permanent establishment, how do you tax it in UK? Sir, please make me re re revise the rule. Okay, so just go up. Just go up. Overseas companies. Here is the overseas companies. Okay, and here comes the overseas branch permanent establishment. It is treated as the same as a UK entity. Okay, it will be taxed in UK. It will be treated same as the UK entity. It will be taxed in UK. It will be taxed in normal manner. Okay, unless you have claimed the exemption. Unless you have claimed the exemption. So, what did he ask? The rate of corporation tax which will be suffered by Mott Limited. So, Mott Limited will suffer 19% UK tax, but since it is already paying 13% in overseas, since it is already paying 13% in overseas, so the net tax which it will suffer in UK is 6%. The net tax which it will suffer in UK is 6%. What else is asking? The matters to consider when they're deciding, uh, when deciding whether or not to make an election of exemption. Exempt the profits of permanent establishment in Puran from UK tax. What matters we should consider while making the exemption election? What matters we should consider while making exemption election? So just go open the summary notes you can make the exemption election but if you make the exemption election no profits will be taxed there will be no loss relief there will be no capital allowances okay and it applies on all overseas branches and the relief is not revocable no tax on profits if you make the exemption election no loss relief no capital allowance and and the relief is irrevocable and it applies on all overseas branches i have a question from you people is it difficult tell me i think that it's not difficult the first in the list company asked us about the transfer price then in mod limited he asked us about the rate of tax and then he asked us about the exemption election. My question is that if it is not difficult, why the pass rate is 45%? Why the pass rate is 45%? Do you know the meaning of 45% pass rate? That 55% of the students fail. Why do 55% students fail when the exam is so easy? Because these 55% of the students don't practice attempt wise. I will make it clear. You people do practice, but you people practice topic wise. You study a topic, you do a past paper. You study a topic, you do a past paper. The advanced text is such a big paper that when you look all the rules together, you get mixed up. The rules start running out of the mind. When you look the entire paper together, the rules start running out of them. So the most important thing which can increase your chances of passing the exam. That you have to do the complete papers and at least five papers. Before going to the exam on the software in the time restriction. Okay, the mock paper is given to you by the ACC. ACC has been emphasizing on this issue since last several attempts that do complete attempt wise papers, do the mock exams, and send them to your tutor for marking. If you don't have a tutor, send me, I'll mark one paper for free to all of the students who are listening my webinar. Okay, so taxation of profits generated overseas. Uh, the summary notes of law are the file which is attached here in the handouts. The document which I have opened on my screen is the complete booklet of my advanced text. This includes the practice questions and everything also. Okay, so 
taxation of profits generated overseas. So it's a nine marks requirement. Let's start. Let's start taxation of profits generated overseas. Now in this first, we have to deal with the list company. Now for list company, what did he ask? Explain the implications in relation to UK corporation tax payable of list company charging JAG limited inflated price. Charging JAG limited inflated price for its components in order to maximize profits of the group, which are taxed in Silana. JAG limited is a small enterprise for the purpose of the transfer pricing regime. So if list company will charge will charge inflated prices to jag limited to jag limited for components it is selling then it will come under rules of under rules of transfer pricing then it will come under rules of transfer pricing why List company is controlled by JAG Limited as it owns 100% shares in list company. Okay, charging a non arm's length price will be subject to transfer pricing rules. Okay. If this company will charge inflated prices to JAG Limited for components it is selling, then it will come under rules of transfer pricing. List company is controlled by JAG Limited as it owns 100% shares, as it owns 100% shares, okay, in list company. Charging, charging a non-arm's length price will be subject to transfer pricing rules. Now, as list company is resident in country of Silana with whom UK has no double taxation treaty, with whom UK has no double taxation treaty, therefore it will be regarded as a company in non qualifying territory okay as list companies resident in country of Solana with whom UK has no double tax treaty where was it written it was written here you can read here you can read here there is no double tax treaty between UK and either the country of Solana or the country of Quran as list company is resident in the country of Silana with whom UK has no double tax treaty. Therefore, it will be regarded as a company in non-qualifying territory. Anti-avoidance rule of transfer pricing will get applicable as JAG Limited, a UK resident con company is transacting with list company, a company in non-qualifying territory. Okay, what will happen due to transfer price anti-avoidance rule? As per anti-avoidance rule, as per anti-avoidance rule, tax department will convert the transaction to arms length transaction. This means that if list company will do transaction at inflated prices, tax department, tax department will convert this transaction to arm's length and will reduce profits of list company and increase profits of JAG Limited and increase profits 
of JEG Limited. Now, what they are trying to do is, just listen to me. What they are trying to do is that they want to do the transaction at inflated price. That list company will charge a higher price. List company will charge a higher price. When list company will charge a higher price, automatically list company revenue will increase. Or when list company will charge a higher price, automatically list company revenue will increase. So due to anti avoidance adjustment, the tax department will reduce the list company profits and will increase the profits of JEG Limited. Now, one student is, sir, what would have happened if double tax treaty would have existed? If the double tax treaty would have existed, then list company would be in qualifying territory. Then list company would be in qualifying territory. And if it would be in qualifying territory, then anti avoidance would not have applied. One student is asking that, sir, please repeat. Okay, let's repeat it again. No need to worry. Now, see what the question is. List company, a company within a group. List company, a company within a group. It will transact with JAG Limited. List company will sell components to JAG Limited. But what the group is planning that list company will sell these components at inflated price. List company will sell these components at inflated price. What is inflated price? A higher price. List company will sell these components at inflated price. What is inflated price? A higher price. So that the list company profits can increase and JAG limited profits can fall. Because List company is in Solana where tax rates are low. You can look here. List company is in Solana where tax rates are low. The tax rate is 11%. What they are planning is that list company, listen to me, list company will sell components to JAG Limited. See, uh, it is intended that JAG Limited will purchase components for list company and import them for use in its manufacturing trade. In the view of low tax rate in Solana, I am considering a pricing strategy which would maximize the profits of the gear of the group which are taxed there. So basically, they want to do the transaction at inflated terms. Since it is the transaction within the group, so it will be caught, it will be subject to transfer pricing regulations. Okay. List company is resident in Solana, so on, Sil on list company, Solana tax will be applicable. On list company, Solana tax will be applicable. List company is in Solana. Solana's tax rate is 11%, okay, which is low. So what the group is planning that list company will sell components to Jet Limited at an inflated price. So the profits get transferred to list company and list company pay tax at a lower rate. Now, since it is an intra-group transaction, so transfer pricing regulations will get applicable. Okay, now as list company is resident in the country of Solana with whom UK has no double tax treaty, therefore it will be regarded as a company in non-qualifying territory. Whatever you do, overprice or underprice, whatever you do, whatever you do, since the company is in a non-qualifying territory with whom UK has no double tax treaty, even if it is an SME, but we are transacting with a company which is in non-qualifying territory. We are transacting with a company which is in a non-qualifying territory, so anti-avoidance will apply. Now, what the anti-avoidance will do? It will convert the transaction into arms length. It will convert the transaction into arms length. What anti-avoidance will do? It will convert the transaction into arm's length. Now, when the transaction will be converted to arm's length, this inflated price drama will end. This company charge inflated price, so the tax department will say, okay, reduce your profit and JAG limited profits will increase. So entire this game and drama scene will end. Is it clear now? Is it clear, everyone? 
what if the double tax treaty existed if the double tax treaty would have existed then list company would be in a qualifying territory and if it would be in qualifying territory then anti avoidance would not have applied the anti avoidance would not have applied then this over under pricing game would have continued the tax department would not have said anything okay is it clear so read the requirement so explain the implications in relation to uk corporation tax payable of list company charging inflated price for its components in order to maximize the profits of the group which are taxed in silana okay jag limited is a small enterprise for the purpose of transfer pricing regime now we have to look at mot limited okay okay guys um we are going for a short namaz break uh, i have a isha break here so namaz break we will resume in 15 minutes okay then we will revise list company and we'll move towards mod company okay we are going for a 15 minutes break
So let's resume. Everyone, please confirm me if you people can hear me. Okay. So we are resuming back. One student has asked the question that if the company is SME, do it still faces the rules of anti-avoidance? Yes, it still faces if it is in a non-qualifying territory. Okay. And uh, the recording of this session and the recording of a uh, few more past papers, I'll guide you at the end of the session where you can find them. Okay. Currently, let's start. Okay, now, so uh, we were discussing what? We were having a discussion on list company. Uh, so the fact that they said SME rather than large company makes no difference. Yes, it makes no difference in this case because the, um, the company is in non-qualifying territory. Okay, uh, if you want, you can revise the rule here from the summary notes also. Um, if you go uh, in the transfer pricing topic, here in the transfer pricing, you can look at the summary notes. Um, large companies will always face transfer pricing loss. Anti-avoidance will also apply on SME if they are in overseas country, which is a non-qualifying territory. So if an SME is in a non-qualifying territory, so yes, it will be treated like a large company. Okay, so resuming back again, list company, we were talking that there was some intra-group transaction which was being done at inflated price. There was some intra-group transaction which was being done at inflated price. So we said that as per anti-avoidance regulation, uh, the transaction will be converted to arms length. Okay, now, now for MOT Limited, explain the rate of corporation tax which will be suffered by Moth Limited in the UK on the profits generated by its permanent establishment in Puran. So now listen to it. Now Moth Limited is a UK resident company as Moth Limited is a UK resident company. Therefore, therefore its profits earned by, therefore, profits earned by its permanent establishment in Puran will be subject to normal UK corporation taxes. However, any overseas tax paid will be relieved through double taxation relief. I will repeat it again. As Moth Limited is a UK resident company, you can find it in the schedule. Moth Limited country of residence is UK. Moth Limited is doing business in Puran. Moth Limited carries on its trade in Puran, where it has its production and distribution facility. Okay, so what did he ask? The rate of corporation tax, which will be suffered by Mont Limited in UK on the profits generated by its permanent establishment in Puran. So, as Mont Limited is a UK resident company, therefore profits earned by its permanent establishment in Puran will be subject to normal UK corporation taxes. However, any overseas tax paid will be relieved through double taxation relief. Now, it has paid overseas tax, not limited, pays overseas tax of 13% in Puran. Okay. Tax rate in Puran is, is 13%. Whereas tax rate in UK, whereas tax rate in UK is 19%. Moth Limited will face net 6% UK tax after adjustment of double taxation relief in UK. Okay, so Moth Limited will face net 6% UK tax. Okay, will suffer, will face 6% net UK tax after adjustment of double taxation relief. 
Okay. Now, one question one student has asked, it is related to the previous thing. Let me answer him. So, what if a large company is in a qualifying territory? No, the large company will always face NPO. For SME, if it is in UK or if it is in qualifying territory, then no anti avoidance. But if it is in a non qualifying territory, then anti avoidance gets applicable. Okay. Just a small rule, a small sketch, you can make it. Large company always face anti avoidance. SME. If in UK, if in qualifying territory, no anti avoidance. If in a non qualifying territory, then anti avoidance gets applicable. Okay. Coming back to this part. So, as Moth Limited is a UK resident company, therefore profits earned by its permanent establishment in Puran will be subject to normal UK corporation taxes. However, any overseas tax paid will be relieved through double taxation relief. So, as the overseas tax rate in Puran is 13%, UK tax is 19%. So, net 6% tax will get applicable. Okay, let's look at the email. What else he's asking? The matters to consider whether or not to make an election to exempt the profits of the permanent establishment in Puran from UK tax. Now, what are the matters we can consider? Now, it's very simple. If you make the exemption election, there will be no UK tax, which means that the net 6% tax you are paying in UK will be saved. There will be no UK loss relief. Keep it in mind. If there will be any losses in future, you will not get any loss relief. There will be no UK capital allowances. The exemption election is irrevocable. You cannot go back. It's for lifetime. And it applies on all branches which are present today and which will be formed in future. Okay? Now, if Mott Limited, if Mott Limited makes exemption election on its overseas permanent establishment, on its overseas permanent establishment of Puran, then, then there will be no UK tax on its profits of overseas permanent establishment. This means that net 6% UK tax payable currently in UK will get saved. However, it needs to keep in mind that if this exemption election is made, then there will be no UK loss relief on overseas permanent establishment losses on overseas permanent establishment losses if they arise however it needs to be keep in mind that if this exemption election is made then there will be no uk loss relief on overseas permanent establishment losses if they arise further there will be no uk capital allowance on overseas permanent establishment assets. This exemption election is irrevocable. Is irrevocable, which means that it will apply forever. Lastly, this exemption election will be applicable on overseas permanent establishments present today and which will be formed in future. So now if someone feels that writing this is difficult, he need to revise the rules first because these rules are simply written here. You can go in the head of overseas companies. You can go in the head of overseas companies. And here it's written that there is an election of overseas ex branch exemption. Believe me, it's very easy. 
advanced taxation is a very very easy paper i teach advanced audit also i have 10 nationwide positions in advanced audit also i have been teaching advanced audit from the same time but if someone asks me that whether triple a or whether atx which one is easier to pass so i will always say that advanced tax is easier to pass because it is just about remembering the rules in advanced audit it is about writing technique it's a subjective thing advanced tax is not subjective it is a straight forward thing you just need to remember the rules and you just need to practice it now why do the students fail either they don't study the rules properly but what i believe is the 90% of the students who pay such a heavy exam fees study the rules like there will be 10% students who don't study the rules 90% of the students pay the study the rules but why these 90% also get failed because see if there is 100% 10% are the rubbish students who don't even study 90% now from this 90% only half gets passed because the pass rate is 45% so why the other half fails because they don't practice attempt wise papers they only do the exam kit the teachers only focus on the exam kit the exam kit gives the topical pass paper practice i also do the topical pass paper practice topical pass paper practice is important it gives clarity but only topical practice is not sufficient because when you look all the rules together you will go mad in the exam you will get confused if anyone has given the paper earlier he will agree with my statement if someone is going for second or third attempt he will agree with my statement that in advanced taxation since all the, there are so many rules when you go in the exam everything gets mixed car benefit fuel benefit accommodation gift gift relief in car everything gets mixed and sometimes near the exam students ask very stupid questions from us it seems that they have mixed up everything one student asked me last week that sir uh, the renter room relief and uh, the letting relief are they both same so she mixed the property income and cdd what i am trying to say is that you study the topics you may be good on that but you need to practice the complete papers so you have control on the complete papers and you are able to deal with the exam time pressure that is very important you know that if you miss out 20 marks in the advanced tax exam it's very difficult to pass okay i hope that you people will take my advices very seriously okay let's come back let's resume so uh coming back we are done with this one also we commented on the transfer pricing issue we commented on the rate of corporation tax which will be suffered by mot limited and the matters to be considered while making an election to exempt now the last part is something relating to vat let's look at it i have already established that list company cannot be included within group vat registration with jag limited with this in mind explain which of the other companies within the group could be included in group vat registration question what is group vat registration what is group vat registration can you people tell me what is group vat registration anyone when we talk about group vat registration it is about making one return for the entire group it is about making one group for the entire group companies which have a common parent more than 50% holding we can make a single vat return we can ignore the intra group transactions making a single vat return but obviously for the group vat registration it is important that the company should be doing its business in uk okay so we can make a vat group which of the other companies would be included in the group vat registration so if i look at the uh, group structure if i look at the group structure there is jag limited there is cord limited there is list company and there is mot limited jag cord resident in uk trading activity in uk okay now all of the companies are owned whole 
whole of the share capital is owned by Jag Limited. So there is no issue of 51% ownership. There is entire ownership owned by Jag. So Jag and Cord are in the group right? There is no issue in it. Jag and Cord are in group right? There is no issue in it. For list, it's a Solana company. So obviously it cannot come in group back. And the question also states it very clearly. I have already established that list company cannot be included within group back. Within group back, list cannot be included. Now, if I talk about Mott Limited, now Mott Limited is resident of UK, but its entire business is in Puran. Now, can it be included in the right group? So now here you need to understand a small rule. In order to be included in the group VAT, you should have your main trading activity in UK. Or you should have your main head office in the UK. Now we don't know about Mott Limited. Apparently, if you read here, Mott Limited carries on its trade in Puran. Apparently, Mott Limited has no significant existence in UK. It is resident of UK, but we don't know about its registered head office and we don't know about its main trading activity. Apparently, its main trading activity is in Puran. So, please read the question again. Which of the other companies within the group, which of the other companies within the group could be included within group head registration? JAG and COD can be included. Jag and Cod can be included. Okay. For less, he has already stated that it's not part of that group. For Mott Limited, for Mott Limited, it is resident of UK. For Mott Limited, it is resident of UK. But being resident of UK is not only sufficient for that. Residency status is for corporation tax. For that, you need to have your main head office in the UK, not just the registered head office, the main activity office, or you must be doing your business in UK. So apparently, Mott Limited will not be included because its main business is in Puran. Okay, so then what he has asked, then he has asked the, any potential ad disadvantage, any potential disadvantage relevant to the JAG Limited group of registering for that as a group. Anyone, can anyone tell me? Disadvantage for registering as a group? Mean business means main trading activity, yes. Can anyone tell me uh, the disadvantage of registering as a group? Anyone? Anyone? Disadvantage of registering as a group? If there is any issue, we will face a joint penalty. Okay, if there will be any issue, we will face a joint penalty. Okay, then if there is delay by any one company in the group, all the group will face the penalty. Uh, it's bad group. There are no losses, please. Someone said losses, please. Okay, so if there will be any issue, the whole group will face penalty. Yes, the de minimis test can uh, de minimis test de minimis test of partial exemption rule can get failed at group level. De minimis test. You remember that six twenty five rule. It can get failed at the group level. Okay. Then the companies within the group can face an issue that if some company was getting a recovery, it will get offset with the payable of any other company. So the recovery company will face the cash flow issue. Okay. I'll repeat it again. Like, for example, if company A was getting a recovery of that and company B will have to pay the back, so the tax department will net off both of them. So obviously the company A can do an intra-group settlement with them, but, but, but the intra-group settlement will take some time because normally in the group they say, okay, we'll pay later. But the, the recovery of that company will not be proceeded. Okay. And the VAT implication for JAG limited purchasing components from list company. So now, as you all know that UK is no more part of European Union. UK is no more part of European Union. So if JAG Limited, a UK company, will purchase from list company, it will be import. And on import, we have to pay VAT before getting the goods released. 
on imports we have to pay VAT before getting the goods released from the bounded warehouse at the port. However, we can recover the VAT later if we are registered for it. So let's develop the answer. Let's see how many marks. This is the last requirement, eight marks. Believe me, it's very easy. Believe me, let's, let's develop, let's develop that. Okay. So that, uh, what is the first thing he asked? Which of the other companies within the group can be included for group VAT registration? Uh, for group VAT registration, for group VAT registration, companies under more than 50% control, more than under, more companies under more than 50% share ownership, share ownership can be included, can be included in case of JAG limited group, in case of JAG limited group, JAG limited owns, owns whole of the share capital of Cord Limited, a uh, list company, and Mott Limited. Okay. Another condition is that company should be having its trade in UK or its main office in UK. Okay. Considering this requirement, considering this, group VAT registration will only be permitted for JAG Limited and Quad Limited. Okay. List company, for list company also stated in the question, so it's not. Uh, important to write it, but if you want, you can cover it. List company is resident and doing business in Solana. Okay, it has no presence in UK. For Mott Limited, for Mott Limited, for Mott Limited, its main trade is in uh, Puran. For Mott Limited, its main trade in, is in Puran. So uh, it will only be included in VAT group registration if its main head office is in UK. And we don't know about this. There is no data given about this. So, um, Yes, the, the all the schemes, the cash accounting scheme, annual accounting scheme, cash accounting, cash accounting, annual accounting, and flat rate scheme. These all schemes are not available if you go for group registration. They are not available. Okay. Now, this issue was also tested one time in the past paper. Now, this is why I ask you people to do the complete paper so that you can uh, get these small, small things. Like in this question, you got a clarity on one small thing that. Uh, uh, it's necessary to either have the main trade or the main office in UK to get yourself registered in group VAT. So doing the past papers is the key. Once you have studied the topics, then go for the past paper and do as much past paper as you can. The only thing, whenever I ask the position holder students, the only thing they say is that, sir, we do past papers at least two to three times. And it's not one passport, it's like 10, 12 past papers. Okay, so companies which can't be included in VAT group, can they be included in capital gains group? Yes, they can be included in capital gains group. Capital gains group and 75% group are completely different. VAT group is a different thing. In capital gains group and in 75% group, we can include overseas companies, but they don't get the privilege. That's a different thing, but they are part of the group. So for group VAT registration, companies, under more than 50% ownership can be included. In case of JAG Limited Group, JAG Limited owns whole of the share capital of Cord Limited, List Company, and Mott Limited. Another condition is that company should be having its trade in UK or its main office in UK. Now, considering, the, considering this, group registration will only be permitted for JAG and Cord. 
Liz is in Silana, resident in Silana, business in Silana. Mot, business in Puran. We don't know about its head office. We don't know about its head office. Both direct and indirect required is 51%. Okay, now, so the first thing which he asked was which of the other companies within the group can be included with the group registration. So this is done. The potential disadvantage relevant to JAG limited group of registering for VAT as a group. So what can be the potential disadvantage? Potential disadvantage of registering as a group for VAT, as a group for VAT can be that if any of the company within group makes any error while submitting data for group VAT return, then it can result in a penalty for the entire group, for the entire group. They will be liable, they will be liable jointly for it, okay? So if any what company will make any error, the whole group will get liable. Potential disadvantage of registering as a group for that can be that if any company can be that if any company within the group makes any error while submitting data for group VAT return, then it can result in a penalty for entire group. They will be liable jointly for it. Okay. What else he has asked? The VAT implication for Jack Limited purchasing components from list company. If Jack Limited if JAG Limited will purchase components from list company, then it will be regarded as an import done by UK resident company as JAG Limited is a UK resident company, whereas list company is an overseas company. Okay, JAG Limited has to pay VAT on components imported, on components imported before their release from bounded warehouse at port. Okay, JAG Limited has to pay comp VAT on the components imported. Okay, however, it can recover that paid later if it uses those components in taxable supplies. Okay, so yes, one disadvantage was sufficient because there were other things also asked in this issue. The first thing was in relation to group VAT registration. Okay that who can be included in the registration. Then there was some potential disadvantage. And then there was import of components. So if you look at this entire question, if you look at this entire question, uh, the document which we made, it's December 2021, answer one. I will share you my other answers also, because I've been making my other answers for my existing students. As promised, I will share three papers with you, and then you people will do one mock, and you people will send me for marking, okay? So if you look at this entire answer, um, it's done, first five marks for ethics, then chargeable gain of court limited, overseas profits and then VAT and there were professional marks. So do we have to write a conclusion? No, it's not necessary. The examiner no, do not write it normally, so it's not necessary. Let's go through this answer one time again before moving towards the question number two. So if you look at it, believe me, this is easy. Believe me. You just need some confidence. Uh, like 
with the confidence you people did this answer with me. See, we did the entire question and we didn't face a difficulty even one time. Yes, I will agree that there were some marks which were difficult. But for this, I always say to my students is that you pass at 50, you don't pass at 100. You pass at 50 marks, you don't pass at 100 marks. So don't go for perfection. Okay, don't go for perfection. Don't frustrate yourself in the exam. If you look at this entire answer, see, this part, uh, the, uh, the format of the memorandum, it, it's, it's just learning it. It's just learning it. You get one mark for this, for making this format. There are four professional marks. One mark for making the format. One mark for solving the, the answer in sequence, like you do part A, part B, part C, part D. One mark for making the format of the memorandum. One mark for following the sequence. Don't shuffle up the requirements. Solve the requirements in sequence. Then two marks for overall presentation. Use headings. Answer in a clear manner. That's all. I think that th th this is not difficult. Then five marks for the ethics. Becoming tax advisor to Jack Limited group of companies. Believe me, these are cash marks. Cash. I will use word cash. Keep it in the, in the pocket. Just easy ones. Easy five marks that what are the matters we'll consider before accepting the engagement. Then there was rollover relief. Believe me, that rollover relief is a topic of basic taxation. Even a student of TX will be able to answer this. Okay, so qualifying assets. So yes, rollover will be available. What are the qualifying assets? What is the qualifying period? What are the companies within qualify in the capital gains group? Then eight delivery vans are movable. So no rollover relief on them. There is no deferral on movable machines. Then on fixed machine, yes, it will be available. No privilege for overseas company. And then the calculation of rollover relief. What's difficult in it? Okay. Then, then list company. Simple, easy topic of transfer pricing. Simple, easy topic of transfer pricing. Overseas company in a non-qualifying territory. Anti-avoidance regulation will apply always. Then MOT limited, overseas branch issue exemption and then lastly there was group pact believe me this is not difficult believe me is it clear is it clear everyone done sir where will we find the recordings of these sessions okay you can find the recording of this session on the acca youtube channel number one those students who are my existing students, they can find the recordings on their learning management system. And you can find the recording of these sessions on my YouTube channel. You can find the recording of this session on my YouTube channel. You can go to YouTube on the search tab. You can write OS Mirchawala. You can go to my channel. You can go to my channel OS Mirchawala. Here you go to my channel, okay? And there is an entire playlist. There is an entire playlist made with the name of ATX past paper discussion. And I've already uploaded one past paper here for you people, which is June, 2021. June, 2021 paper is already available on my channel. The today's session, the December 2021 paper, which is being currently being conducted, this will be uploaded in a day or two. The, it will be available here on my channel also. It will be available on ACCA channel also. And for my existing students, it will be available on the learning management system also. So June 21 paper, it's already available on my channel. You can go to West Mirchawala, you can go to my playlist, and you can look at the June 21 paper. It's already there for your practice. December 21 paper, which we are doing currently, it will get uploaded. And as promised, I will give you one more paper complimentary here on my channel. Okay, so three papers. Okay, 
for practice with me and then one mock paper you will solve and you'll send to me. Is it clear? Now, let's move forward. Let's move forward and let's look at question number two. So now we are moving forward. We press next. So here is the question number two. Let's look at it. I believe that question one was clear. My summary notes are attached in the handouts tab of your webinar. You can click it there. And after the session, I will share on the WhatsApp group also. Okay, now let's start the second question. You should assume that today's date is 1st September 21. We are starting with second question, okay? Your manager has received an email Your manager has received an email, just a second, has received an email from, a, uh, uh, from Lucille, a client of your firm, extracts from the email and from an email from your manager detailing the work you are required to do are included in the exhibits. The following exhibits available on the left-hand side of the screen provide information relevant to the question, okay? Email extract from Lucille, email extract from the manager. Only important information here is the today's date, which is 1st September 2021. Okay, let's start reading the email extract from Lucille. And I hope that this one will also be easy. So, I was born in UK and lived there until I was 35 years old. On 1st May 2000, I moved, to, I moved to the country. I moved to the country of Tevera, where I lived until I moved back to the UK on 1st March 2021. Okay, so she was born in UK. She has lived in UK. For 35 years, on 1st May 2000, she moved to the country of Tevera, where she lived, and then she moved back to UK in March 21, which is about 21 years. Okay, I'm renting out my home in Tevera and will retain the rental income after expenses of £800 per month in that country to use when I visit there in future. Income from employment in the tax year 21-22. On 6th April 2021, on 6th April 2021, on 6th April 2021, I began working full time in the UK for BKB Limited. For the tax year 2021 22, my employment package will comprise the following a gross salary of 87,800. Employment income benefits in respect of a car and accommodation amounting to £26,230, 7,200 ordinary shares issued to me by BKB Limited on 1st May 2021 as introductory. Thank you for joining the company. I paid 14400 for these shares which had a market value of 23,200 at that time. So it will be a simple employment benefit. So she's earning a gross salary, she's getting some benefits, and she is getting some shares, which is a normal taxable benefit. Now, sale of investment property situated in Tevera. On 1st February 2021, I sold an investment property situated in Tevera. This sale resulted in a considerable profit as I had owned the property for many years, having purchased it on February 2005. The proceeds of the sale are currently deposited in the bank account in Tevera, although I would like to bring this money into the UK in near future. Creation of a trust. Now, obviously, this is first time reading of the question. Normally, first time reading of the question is just about identifying the data. So don't get confused while you read the question for the first time. I inherited a portfolio of shares following the death of my father in January 15. 
I have sold some of my holdings since then and either purchase shares in different company or use the proceeds to fund my personal expenditure. All of the companies concerned are UK registered trading companies, which are quoted on the main London Stock Exchange. The value of my portfolio is now considerable. I now intend to establish a discretionary trust for the benefit of my two nieces. I will give quoted shares worth 400,000 to the trust. On 1st December 21, I will pay any inheritance tax which arises when this gift is made. So if I read this entire scenario, uh, she has moved to Tevera since 2000. She returned to UK in 2021. She returned to UK in 2021. Okay. She, uh, she moved from UK, moved out from UK. She moved to Tevera in 2000. And then she's returning to UK in 21. She has some employment package. No, no, no. It's not 10 months. It's 21 years. May 2000 and March 2021. Okay, the question will get killed if you will miss the year. Then there is an employment package, uh, which includes some gross salary. There are some employment benefits and then there are some shares. Then there was some sale of investment property, which is being sold in February 21, which was before returning to UK. So from the apparent reading, I believe from the apparent reading, I'm using the word, from the apparent reading, I believe that uh, this will not be subject to any UK tax because it was purchased in 2005 when she was a non-resident. It was purchased in 2005 when she was a non-resident. It will be sold in February 21 when she's non-resident. So apparently there will be no tax on it, but obviously we'll look at it in detail when we'll be solving it. Then there is some cross fees um, she plans to give something to trust, so it will be a CLT. Okay, so we look at it. Now let's open the email from the manager, which will give us some detail about the requirements. Let's look at it, what it's saying. Additional information obtained from discussion with Lucille. Lucille has a UK domicile of origin. Lucille has a UK domicile of origin. She acquired a domicile of choice in the country of Tevera in the tax year 2001-2. Despite having returned to UK, she is not going to acquire a UK domicile of choice. She had the domicile of origin. Then she changed her actual domicile to Tevera in 2001-2. He will not take the actual domicile of UK. But here I want you people to remember the rules of deemed domicile status. Do you people remember? You people need to remember the rules of deemed domicile status for the people who are formerly resident of UK. Formerly resident means who were born in UK, who had UK's domicile of origin. They become deemed domicile if they are resident in the relevant text here. If you have forgotten the rules, I will take you to the summary notes. Okay, and I want you all to be very hands-on with these summary notes. This will be very helpful for you. Okay. Now I'll go up to find the rules of deemed domicile status. Mm -hmm. Now, in inheritance tax and in CGT, there is deemed domicile status. Now, here is the, the rule for IHT, people who are formerly domiciled. Individuals who are born in UK, have a domicile of origin, are resident in the current tax year. 
okay c one is the 15 year rule that is we call them long term residents here the rule of long term resident is not applicable here the rule of formerly domicile will get applicable because she was born in uk she was born in UK. The formerly resident domicile rule will get applicable. She was born in UK. She had the domicile of origin. Okay. So here we will not look at the long-term resident rule. Here we look at the formerly, the, the birth rule. Okay. I hope it's clear. Okay. So if anyone has forgotten, I'll just give you a review again. If you are born in UK, then you become deemed domicile. You become deemed domicile due to formerly domicile rules. Okay. Uh, we will we, we'll look at the status of the leucil specifically. We'll look at the years. But currently, while reading, I just need to give you the reminder that these rules may get applicable on her. Okay. Leucil was resident until she moved to Tevera on 1st May 2000. She was then non-resident until 2021. She will be UK resident for the tax year 21-22. Shares in BKB Limited are not readily convertible assets, which means that it's an unquoted company shares. You should assume that Lucil will have dividend income of 18,300 in the tax year 21-22 in respect of her shares portfolio. There is no CGT or IST in Tevera. Okay. So it's first time reading of the question. We are just identifying the data and we are trying to understand as much as we can. But obviously detailed work will start now while we read out that what he asked from us to do. Please carry out the following work. Lucille's financial position for the tax year 21-22. Lucille cannot understand why, despite receiving a substantial amount of UK source income, her annual personal expenditure of 57,600 exceeds her post-tax income. Why her personal expenditure exceeds her post-tax income? Prepare calculation for the tax year 21-22 in order to explain why Lucil is in this financial position. So we know her personal expenditure. Now we need to calculate her post-tax income. We need to calculate her post-tax income. While carrying out this work, you should ignore the rental income in respect of the Lucil's home in Tevera. Don't think about that. So let's look at the part A and how much marks does it give us? Um, if I look at it, some nine marks. So let's start. Lucille's financial position for the tax year 21-22. Okay, so let's start this question. I want you all to concentrate. This will be a bit planning type question. But no need to worry, it will be done. Question number two. Lucille, okay, and we are doing this part A, okay, let's start. Okay, so we have to work on Lucille's financial position, what he has asked. Prepare calculation for the tax year 21-22 in order to explain why Lucille is in the is in this financial position and summarize your finding. So, what is her problem? Why her personal expenditure of 57,600 exceeds her available post-tax income? Okay. So, what I will do is that I will make a table at the start which will summarize this situation. Okay. Lucille's post-tax income, which we have to calculate. We have to calculate the Lucille's post-tax income, and then we will compare it with the Lucille's personal expenditure. Okay, 
So first we'll calculate the Lucille's post-tax income. How we'll calculate the Lucille's post-tax income? It will include its inflows less the tax. And then Lucille's personal expenditure. What is our personal expenditure? It's 57,600. We know that. Oops. 57,600. Just give me a minute. Since you're starting the question, so it takes some time while we make the starting adjustments. Now we have to calculate her post tax income. Obviously, we will be doing working for it. Okay. Difference amount. Okay. And here we will add a summary for her. So I have made a head for that. And now we are starting with her post tax income calculation. Okay. Let's see. It's it's not necessary that uh, you do the all all the formatting like me, but I personally prefer that. Try and do the make the paper more and more presentable, um, so that it's it's easier for the examiner to understand, and the things get easier for him. Okay, and use the tables as much as you can because the tabular form of presentation makes it more easy and presentable for the user. Now, so what did he ask? He asked us uh, prepare calculation for the tax year 21-22 in order to explain why Lucil is in this financial position and summarize your finding. So now we have to calculate her post-tax income. Now here, one thing which you need to understand is, listen to me, listen to me. One thing which you need to understand is that the income with which you pay your personal expenditure, please listen to me, the income with which you pay your personal expenditure is the cash earning. I'll repeat it again. Now, this was the possible error which students can do here. The income with which you pay your expenditure is your cash earning. Like if you look at the question, look at the question. Now, this was a very good thing. If you look at it here, you still get some employment income benefits also. Now, what are those employment income benefits? It includes a car, it includes accommodation. You cannot pay your expenses through car and accommodation. You cannot pay your expenses through car and accommodation. You need to understand this. How will you pay your expenses through car and expenditure? Similarly, you got, you got 7,000 shares also. You got 7,000 shares also from BKB Limited. But it's written here in the question, if you read it, that these shares are not readily convertible assets. So, Lucille can only pay her expenses through the cash earnings. Lucille can only pay her expenses through her cash earnings. Now, what are her cash earnings? Her cash earnings include this gross salary. Her cash earning includes this gross salary of 87,800. It includes some dividend, which I remember we read here. It includes this dividend of 18,300, okay? So what you need to understand is, Lucille will only be able to pay her expenses, her personal expenses from her cash earnings, okay? Car benefit, accommodation benefit, and other non-cash benefits, okay, which also include shares of BKB Limited, which are not a readily convertible asset, cannot be used to pay personal expenses, okay? However, Tax gets applicable on all earnings. The tax is applicable on all earnings, but you can only pay your personal expenses from your cash earnings. Okay? 
So, what are the cash earnings of Lucille? Okay, so cash earnings of Lucille are salary and dividend. The cash earnings of Lucille are salary and dividend. What is the amount of salary? The amount of salary is 87,800. The amount of salary is 87,800 plus the dividends. What is the amount of dividends? The amount of dividends 18,300. Okay. Just listen to me. And if you have any query, you people can ask me here on the chat if you are attending it live. And if you watch through recording, then you can ask me on my WhatsApp. So the cash earning is 106. One double zero. Okay. The cash earning is one zero six one double zero. Now we have to deduct income tax. We have to deduct national insurance contribution, which he has to pay, and we will get the post tax amount. Okay, which she will be remaining with. Okay. Please listen to me carefully. Okay, these formats are not necessary to make. Maybe you will not be able to do the exam in such a structured manner, but you need to learn this approach. See, see if you will look, look at the examiner answer, it will be in a different manner. The examiner answer will be presented in different manner. But what I want you to do with you people is that I solve the complete paper with you people so that you people can understand that how we develop the answer. Okay, how we develop the answer, you need to understand that. Now we are calculating income tax and NIC for Lucille. Okay, now we are calculating income tax and NIC for Lucille. So, First of all, we will calculate the income tax. Now, now Lucille is having two heads of income, non-saving income, and the other will be dividend income. Now, the first is employment income for her. Now, in employment income, it includes salary. Now, what is the amount of salary? It's 87,800. It goes in head of non-saving. Then, then if you look at the question, there are some employment income benefits, 26,230. Okay. Are you people with me? No one is responding on the question box or everyone has gone sleep. Uh, Non-cash benefits, then share incentive of BKB Limited. Okay, so what was the market value of those shares, which had a market value of 23,200? I paid 14,400 for these shares. So 23,200 minus 14,400. 23,200 minus 14,400. So what is the amount of benefit? 23,200 minus 14,400. It's 8,800. Benefit amount is 8,800. OK, now then we have dividend income. What is the dividend income? The dividend income amount is 18,300. So if I add up all of them, this will give me the total income. See, it's a nine marks requirement. Now, this is not the requirement which involves too much rules. This is the requirement of planning. You have to use your mind. You have to think it is not the one which will be done with a standard format. You have to use your mind. You have to be smart while solving this. Okay. 
Lucille's financial position for the tax year 21-22? The question is that Lucille cannot understand why her post-tax income cannot meet her expenditures. Okay, so we said, okay, we'll calculate your post-tax income. We'll look at your expenditure. We'll find the difference. And he asked us to write some summary comment also. Then we said that you will meet your expenditure from your cash earnings, not from the total earnings. Now, the total earnings include accommodation, all the benefit shares of BKB, which are not readily convertible assets. So we, do, we wrote down our cash earnings. We'll deduct the income tax, we'll deduct the NIC, and we'll reach the post-tax income. Now, we are calculating his income tax. Now, in income tax, there is non-saving and dividend income. Okay. There was employment income, which includes salary, non-cash benefits, BKB limited shares. It was very simple. See, 7,000 ordinary shares were issued to me by BKB as introductory thank you. It's a normal chargeable benefit. There is no thank you like in tax world. I paid 14,400 for these shares, which had a market value of 23,200. So you simply got a benefit. You simply got a benefit 23,200 minus 14,400. So it's a benefit of 8,800. Is it clear? Can anyone tell me the total income? 87,800. No, why it's a CGT? It's an employment benefit. You are not selling the shares. You are just you have just got the shares. Okay. The non-cash benefit value is given here. It's it's written in the question. Employment income benefit in respect of car accommodation is two six two three zero. It's given here. Okay. So, um, some students have sent me. 87,800 plus 26230 plus 8,800. So it's 122,830. 122,830, and here it's 18,300. Now we'll deduct the personal allowance. Can anyone tell me about personal allowance? What will be the personal allowance? Can anyone tell me? Note, you can write a note here, please. Many students are giving me a wrong answer. This is not good. Personal allowance, total income of uh, Lucille is 122830 plus 18,300. So the total will become 122830 plus 18,300. It's 141. It's 141130. Okay. Personal allowance will diminish to zero. Why it will diminish to zero? Why it will diminish to zero? As income exceeds how much? C. A shortcut technique. See a shortcut technique. Maybe some students know this. Your personal allowance is one two five seven zero. Your personal allowance is one two five seven zero. It diminishes by one pound for every two excess. So I will multiply it by two. If there is an excess of twenty five thousand. 140. Listen to me. 12570 is your personal allowance. Listen to me. 12570 is your personal allowance. It diminishes by one pound for every two excess. So multiply it by two. So if there is an excess of 25,140, your limit is 100,000. So if your income exceeds 125140, then your allowance will be zero. Personal allowance will diminish to zero as income exceeds 125140. Sir, please repeat, please repeat again. What is your personal allowance? 12570. 
what is your personal allowance? 12570. It diminishes by one pound for every two excess. So multiply it by two. If there is an excess of 25140, if there is an excess of 25140, the allowance will fall to zero. The limit is 100,000, so add 100,000. So if your income exceeds 125140, the allowance will be zero. Clear? First double 12570. OK, and then add 100,000. Uh, you don't need to calculate ANI here because there was no qualifying donation and personal pension contribution. OK, normally if there would be, yes, you have to calculate. So the personal allowance is zero. The taxable income will be 122,830 and 18,300. Let's calculate the income tax on it on 37,000. First, you will charge the non-saving income, which is 122,830. Now, now I'm doing basic income tax calculation, okay? And I believe that you people know this how to calculate. 37,700 into 20%, so it will be 7540. Then the higher rate band 122830 minus 37700. On difference, you will apply 40%. 122830 minus 37700 into 40%. So it's 34052. Okay. Then we have dividend income of 18,300. On first 2,000, it will be 0%. Very good. So this will give us zero. And then on the remaining, since we are in higher rate band, it will be 32.5%. So it will be 16,300 into 0.325. I add the extra line by pressing tab. On the last cell, you write tab so the extra line gets added. Now, believe me that you people haven't done any one paper on the software. That's why you people are asking such basic things. Please do few papers before going to the exam. So total income tax will be how much? Can anyone tell me? 7540. 34052 5298. So it's 46890. If I'm not wrong, please confirm me. Please confirm me the total 46890. This is the total income tax. Let me make it a bit beautiful. Okay, now it looks good. So this is the income tax. Now, now we have to calculate the NIC also. So here is the income tax. I'll put it here. 46890. What about NIC? Lucille has to pay Class one employee NIC. Whether to use Word or spreadsheet while answering. I told very at the very start, don't use two screens. That, that's why I advise at the very start, use one screen. At the very start, one student asked me that, sir, we should use a spreadsheet or not. So I told you people at the very start, and this was the reason why I because if you would be using spreadsheet and word, you would be just running between the screens. Uh, you write the comment on word, you uh, calculate on the spreadsheet, so that becomes very tiring and time wasting. So that's why I always say use one screen, use the calculator. We have been doing this since uh, we were a child and we are very fast on it. And 
on the word processor, you can make the tables and you can make the things presentable. Lucille has to pay class one employee an IC. On all cash benefits, she's getting, okay? Her cash benefits, her cash benefits include salary and uh, there are cash benefit only include salary. Her cash benefit from job, from employment only include salary. On non-cash benefits, class 1A, employer and IC is payable, but that it is payable by employer, not by Lucil. Okay, so Lucil has to pay class 1 employee and IC on all cash benefits she's getting. So her only cash benefit from the job is her salary. Okay, so class one employee and IC. Uh, her cash benefit is her salary. And what is the amount of her salary? Can anyone tell me? Her salary amount was 87,800. So now, you need to calculate the class one employee and IC. You can go at the text tables. It is given on the left bottom. On the left bottom, see my cursor. On the left bottom, you have the text tables. Okay. Now you will go to the text tables. And the NIC rates, but I believe that these rates are not updated ones. Oh, because the income tax band is not updated. But obviously in the exam, this will be updated one, okay? Currently I'll use from my sheet because the, the, uh, the rate sheet available on the software is not updated. In the exam, it will be updated, okay? In the exam, you will go here in the text table. You will click on the text tables and that will be updated one here. It's not updated, it's old one. So I'll just go to my booklet because in my booklet, I, at the start, I have added the text rate sheet. In the text rate sheet, if I go to the NIC, the class one employee NIC on 95688, it's 0%. Then 95682 it's 12%. So let's start on first 9568, it's 0%, so it's zero. Then, 50270 minus 9568. On the difference, it will be 12%. 50270 minus 9568 into 12%. So it's 4884. 4884. And on the remaining, 87800 minus 508. 270. On the remaining, we will apply 2%. 87,800 minus 50,270. On the remaining, we'll apply 2%. So it's 751. It's 751. So the total NIC will be, can anyone tell me? 4884 plus 751. 5635, very good. Five six three five. So it's the class one employee and I see. I will repeat the things again so there is nothing to worry. Just listen to me carefully. I will remove this column. This is of no use. Make it small so that it looks beautiful. Okay, so five six three five class one employee and I see. We'll go above, we'll write it here. Five six three five. So this is the income tax and NIC which will be payable by her from her cash earnings. Can anyone tell me the post tax amount? One zero six one double zero minus four six eight nine zero minus five six three five. So it's five three five seven five. Five three five seven five. Now, this is her post tax income. We will put it here 53575. Five, so, the deficit amount, 
The deficit amount is 4025. Can anyone tell me that why is she facing such a big deficit? Can anyone tell me that why is she facing such a big deficit? So the biggest reason is, no, 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 no. The biggest reason is in personal allowance. The biggest reason is, please listen, that she have to pay her expenses. Listen to me. She have to pay her expenses from the cash earnings. But the tax is getting applicable on the total. If you just look at her total tax and NIC, if you look at her total tax and NIC, her total tax and NIC is 46890 and 5635. It's, I will use the screen calculator so that students can also understand. 46890 plus 5635. The total is 52525. The total is 52525. Now her cash earning is only 106100, the cash earning, which means she's almost paying 49.5% tax on her cash earnings. This is because that her non-cash earnings are also getting taxed. She is thinking that she's earning 122 plus 18,300. No. She's only getting the cash of 106. Rest all is non-cash. Okay, so let's make a summary also. Lucille has a deficit of 4025 pounds. Has a deficit of 4025 pounds in her cash earnings to pay her personal expenditure. Okay, this is happening despite that her total income, despite that her total taxable income is, now if you look at her total taxable income, we totaled here, her total taxable income is 141,130. This is happening despite that her total taxable income is 141,130. Now, why is this happening? reason of this is a fact that her total taxable income that her total taxable income also includes non cash benefits okay she has to pay personal expenditure from her cash earnings whereas Whereas tax is getting applicable on non-cash earnings also. Okay, greater tax is reducing her post-tax cash earnings, is reducing her post-tax cash earnings, which is causing deficit while paying for personal expenditures, okay? Now, once to, now I, I'll, I'll repeat the entire thing again, so don't worry, okay? And then I'll come back to your queries, okay? Now, what did he ask? He asked us that what is the Lucille's financial position for the tax year 21-22? And he asked us that Lucille is confused Lucil is confused that why she earns so much, but she can't even pay her expenditures of 57,600. Why is it happening? Why is it happening that she's earning so much, but she can't even pay her personal expenditure? The big, basic answer is she lives in UK. She should live in subcontinent where the taxes are low. <laughs> So Lucille's post-tax income. Uh, now, why the Lucille is not able to even pay her personal expenditure when she's earning so much? So now we have to develop that answer. So we started with the post-tax income. Now, the first thing which Lucille needs to understand is 
that you only pay your expenses from your cash earnings. You don't pay your expenses from non-cash earnings. Okay. She, uh, she's only paying her expenses from cash earnings. You cannot pay your expenses from non-cash earnings. Like from car benefit, you cannot pay your expenses. From car benefit, you cannot pay your cash expenses. From accommodation benefit, you cannot pay your expenses. From shares of BKB Limited, you cannot pay your expenses. So the first thing which she should understand is that she can only pay her expenses from the cash earnings. So the second table which I made was that I summed up her cash earnings. She was earning only two things in cash. One was a salary and one was dividend. Rest were car benefit, accommodation benefit, shares of BKB limited, which are non-convertible. So only cash earnings are used to pay your expenses. Only cash earnings are used to pay your NIC. They are used to pay your personal expenses and everything. So we summed up the cash earnings. Then we said, okay, we'll calculate the income tax and we'll calculate the NIC to get the post-tax amount, okay? Now, please, please stick to the question, okay? Don't get uh, involved in other discussion. A fight will start on the chat box. Now, income tax and NIC for Lucille. Now, income tax and NIC for Lucille. So we started with the employment income, salary, non-cash benefits. It was given in the question 26230 share incentives of BKB Limited. Then there was dividend income. So we started calculating the income tax and I believe that this is some basic calculation. Total income 122830, 18,300. Now there was personal allowance thing. Many students missed that. Please alert, please be alert for that. Whenever you see that income is exceeding 100,000, your mind should start thinking about the allowance di diminish. Okay, so we wrote a note here. The total income of Lucille is 122830 plus 18,300. We added up both of them. We added up both of them. Now the personal allowance will diminish to zero. We learned a small trick that since the income exceeds 125140, the allowance will fall to zero. And then we just charge the tax. I believe that this is something very easy and you should not be getting confused in it. Okay. Then there was class one employee and IC. Then there was class one employee and IC, which is applicable on cash benefits only. Okay. We looked at the rates and we just calculated it. We put the income tax and an IC here to calculate the post tax amount. Okay. And this post tax amount was then compared with our personal expenditures to go get the difference amount. Is it clear? Anyone? Any question else which is remaining in the tab? Um, I think the first column of the second table is clear now. Um, anything else, anything else? Because she received non-cash benefits and... Uh, uh, yes, I will say that solving on a single screen is easy. It's my advice. But if you want to use a spreadsheet, yes, you can. And in spreadsheet, yes, you can add the comments. You can add the comments. But obviously, you cannot solve the entire answer on the spreadsheet because if you, if you look at the spreadsheet, uh, like how will you write such big comments on the spreadsheet? You can, you can do the calculations. You can write few comments on the uh, last column, but you cannot write such big comments on spreadsheet. And uh, what the problem happens is that when you use the spreadsheet, you have to use two screens. Like you'll write the big comments on the word and then you'll use the spreadsheet in parallel. I don't advise it, but if someone wants, they can use, obviously it is available. Um, okay. My advice is that you should practice few papers on word processor. You have a lot of time currently. Okay, now there are a few more questions which have come below. Sir, how can we add additional rows in this table? Just click on the last cell and press tab. So the row is added. Again, press tab. Again, row is added. If you want to add a column, press right click. On the column, you have to click insert column. 
for column, you have to use the mouse, but for the rows, you just need to press tab. Okay. You can do undo, control Z to remove it. Okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Sir, when you say an IC is payable on cash earning, oh, one student is asking, sir, why an IC is not on dividends? The NIC is on employment income. Dividend is not an employment income. Now, this is why I say that when you do the complete attempt wise paper, everything gets mixed. Now, if someone will calculate NIC and dividend, the examiner will also get confused. There is no NIC and dividend. Okay. If I use the spreadsheet completely, I believe that using spreadsheet completely is very difficult. It will make your answer a lot unpresentable. Sir, are there any chapters we should read from the book for theory? Uh, I don't recommend uh, reading at this point of time. Just revise the rules which you have studied and now focus on past papers. So we will not get penalized for not using spreadsheet. No ACC has written on the website. It's completely student choice to use whatever tool he want. And even on the screen, first screen he writes, uh, you can read it here. Uh, it's written here. The information should be used to answer the question within your choosing response option. It's your choice. So the best way to remember the rules and not forget them. These summary notes. These summary notes uh, are the best thing. Print them and read them daily. In the morning, in the evening, whenever you get time, read them. Because when you talk about advanced taxation, it is all about remembering the rules and you can only remember the rules by revising them continuously. Uh, this file will be uploaded uh, tomorrow, uh, but today I will share it on the WhatsApp. Okay. But uh, on the handouts tab, it will be uploaded by tomorrow. Okay, so let's wind up. Let's wind up the today's session. Let's wind up the today's session, what we have discussed today. Just give me a second. Let me send a message to the organizer. Um, I didn't save his number as usual. Just give me a second. Okay. Morning session. No. So, so what we have discussed today. Uh, okay. Now some more questions. Why you people ask so many questions? What paper we'll do tomorrow? We'll complete this paper. We'll complete this question two, then we'll do question three, then we'll do question four, and then we'll start one more paper. Is there a link of WhatsApp chat? Yes, there is a link for WhatsApp group. Uh, the organizer has shared, but if you haven't got the link, you can message me on my WhatsApp number. This is my WhatsApp number. You can message me and I'll share you the link. Is there a link? Okay. Nah, I think now all the queries are responded. So, um, what we have discussed today, we started with the December 2021. We completed the question number one, and now we are on question number two. We have done its part A. Tomorrow, we'll complete its part B and part C. Tomorrow we'll complete its part B and part C, and then we'll move towards question three and four. As I told you people at the very start, we will try and complete at least two papers in the in these webinar sessions. If 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 we will not be able to complete them, I will upload my recordings on the YouTube channel, as promised with you people at the very start. Um, I you I'll give you three recordings on my channel. Okay, uh, the ACC channel will the current sessions which will be conducted i'll add few more sessions on my channel and then i want you all to do the mock exam on your own and send me for marking okay thank you everyone i believe that this session has been useful and it will add in your chances of passing the exam okay thank you everyone